So greetings, um, I'm Juma K. Dada and I'm the project manager for the Making Space Initiative. And for this Black History Month, I'm excited to bring to you the State of Cybersecurity Careers for Black Professionals presented by the R Street Institute. For those of you who do not know, the R Street Institute is a nonprofit, nonpartisan public policy research organization, otherwise known as a think tank based in Washington, DC. And R Street's mission is to engage in policy research and outreach to promote free markets and therefore more effective government. Today's program is being brought to you by the Cybersecurity and Emerging Threats Department under the leadership of Tatiana Bolton, who had the vision and the passion to create the Making Space Initiative. In partnership with Share the Mic and Cyber, the goal of the Making Space Initiative is to recognize that in order to prevent the next cyber attack, ransomware attack, or overloaded critical system, we need more diversity. We need new people, we need new solutions, and we need new policies. If we are to effectively address tomorrow's cybersecurity, excuse me, cybersecurity challenges, we need to look at the barriers for diverse talent to enter the workforce and then what we need to do to retain them. So full disclosure, I'm somewhat new to the cybersecurity field. Uh, my journey began uh, last summer after hosting a, a summit for women, of women in cybersecurity and then joining RSI shortly after that. So in these past few months, I've learned a lot about the obstacles and the opportunities that exist in the cybersecurity space and the heavy lift that we have to diversify it. According to the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Careers and Studies, the median salary for cybersecurity professionals is about 103,000, yet over 400,000 jobs went unfulfilled last year. Can you believe that? So whereas I recognize some people may be joining today to learn about job opportunities, a way to break into cybersecurity, we're actually gonna take a different approach and take the angle of what policies do we need to see changed, added, created to affect change. So without further ado, um, let's, let's get started. But before we do, I'm really honored that we have a special message um, from Congresswoman Lauren Underwood. She couldn't join us today, uh, but she prepared a message that we'll, he we'll hear shortly. Uh, Rep. Underwood is the first woman person of color and millennial to represent her community in Congress. She is also the youngest African American woman to serve in the United States House of Representatives. So let's hear this special message from her. Hello, I'm Congresswoman Lauren Underwood, and I proudly represent the people of the 14th District of Illinois in the U.S. House of Representatives. I am delighted to join you in the Making Space Initiative to discuss our shared goals around improving diversity and equity in the cybersecurity space. And I'm especially glad to be joining you all during Black History Month. When I was elected to Congress in 2018, I became the first Black woman to represent the 14th District and the youngest Black woman in Congress. I am proud to hold a place in our region's Black history alongside the trailblazers that came before me. And I'm so glad to be here today to talk about how we can work together to ensure America's cybersecurity workforce really represents America. Cybersecurity plays a major role in every aspect of our daily lives, and it's a role that's only grown during the pandemic. Throughout my time working on these issues, I've seen firsthand how important it is to have a diversity of experts in this field and how dangerous it can be when we don't. I'm glad to see initiatives like yours fighting to open more doors that are still closed. With the growing need for professionals in the cybersecurity workforce, the time is now to address the alarming numbers affecting their entry. We must do the work to ensure that there is representation in the cybersecurity workforce as it grows. Addressing that current lack of diversity is a pressing national security issue. This is an issue that I've been working on and speaking out about throughout my time in Congress. First as a member of the Homeland Security Committee, where I chaired the subcommittee that oversees CISA, and now as an appropriator on the Homeland Security Subcommittee. 
building a talent pipeline in both the public and private sectors is essential to our long-term national security and to the health of our economy. Expansive and growing scientific literature has documented the many ways diverse teams of all kinds outperform homogenous ones, from gender diverse companies making more money to racially diverse juries examining evidence more thoroughly. And a workforce that's not diverse can be a major red flag that we are failing to recruit all the available talent. This is currently evident in the cybersecurity workforce. Only one in four cybersecurity professionals is a woman, one in 10 is black, and one in 25 is Hispanic. Failing to recognize this untapped talent hurts us as a nation. We need to be focused on how we can get this talent on our team because the diversity of experiences and backgrounds itself is a strength. This is a lesson I learned early on in my career. My background is in public health. Throughout nursing school, graduate school, and my time working at the Department of Health and Human Services, I repeatedly encountered instances where a lack of attention to diversity had negatively impacted real people's health and safety. When I came to Congress in 2019, I co-founded the Black Maternal Health Caucus with my colleague, Congresswoman Alma Adams and I introduced the Black Maternal Health Momnibus Act to tackle this crisis. Now, I suspect that if there are more young Black women in Congress, there may already have been a Black Maternal Health Caucus before I was elected. But out of over 12,000 members of Congress in our country's history, fewer than 40 Black women came before me. These are the kind of blind spots that result from a lack of representation in places where decisions are being made, threats are being analyzed, and problems are being solved. The evidence shows these blind spots are dangerous and we need to prevent them. In fact, I'm a case study for the very point I'm making. As a nurse and scientist serving on the Homeland Security Committees, I brought my healthcare experience to national security discussions time after time. It's informed and strengthened my work to improve health security at the southern border, oversee FEMA's response to the pandemic, and fight vaccine disinformation. I've seen firsthand how it makes the national security policies I write stronger. If I were not at the table, that perspective would be missing. Our cybersecurity workforce needs people of all different backgrounds and experiences because they each offer a perspective that would be lost if they weren't at the table. Less diversity means more blind spots in our threat assessments and fewer creative ideas for solutions. With cybersecurity threats increasing every day, those are risks we simply cannot afford to take. Recruiting a diverse cybersecurity workforce is a pressing, pressing national security imperative because a diverse security workforce truly makes us safer and better as a country. I'm so glad we share this goal and I'm looking forward to working together to develop new talent pipelines and invest in the resources we need to recruit and train a world-class security workforce equal to the threats we face. Thank you again for having me and I wish you all the best. That was an excellent and timely message uh, for Rep. Underwood. And we thank her and her team for taking time out today to address each, all of us. So without further ado, we are going to jump into today's uh, panel discussion. I do have one update, uh, however. Uh, Michaela Barnett from uh, Blacks in Cybersecurity will not be joining us, uh, but we still have three amazing panelists and uh, lots, lots to cover. So let's get started. Uh, so today we have uh, Tashaya Denoz of Black Girls in Cyber. She's the Director of Marketing. We have Sanju Walker, a member of Empower, Empower Her. And lastly, we have Safi Mojidi uh, from Hacking the Workforce, and he is the founder. So let's bring everyone up and let's jump into today's conversation. Okay, excellent. Okay, so yeah, let's 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 get into it. Um, so please just quickly introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your organization and how you got started in cybersecurity. Um, I will let Sandra, would you go first? Sure. You're muted. Hi. <laughs> I'm Sanju Walker, and I am in Chicago. I am a privacy engineer, and I have been in the tech field for five years because I did a career change from being 
a city planner uh, for nine years and I went into learning how to code and then information security and I've been in information security for four years. I am representing Empower Her, which is a nonprofit organization for women who are interested in getting into cybersecurity or women who are already in cybersecurity. And it's a space for women of color to network, to have a safe space to talk. And Empower Her also provides leadership skills training uh, from a curriculum that is used to increase, to instill confidence in women, also to grow their soft skills, also technical skills as well. Thank you, Sanju. Uh, Safi, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and your organization? Hi, hi, how are you? Can never find the mute button when you need it. Um, I am Safi Mojiti. Um, I am currently the head of information security at Folks Health. Um, Folks Health is a healthcare company that focuses or centers LGBTQ uh, members of the population in their uh, in the products and the services that they provide. Um, so super excited to uh, be in that position, affecting some change, um, and you know working with a really cool startup that's doing some very interesting things in the healthcare um, industry. Um, I, as I mentioned, um, you know, currently at Folks, uh, I've been in cybersecurity for almost about 15 years now. Um, part of what I've been doing um, was, you know, GRC, managing um, uh, engineering teams, application security teams, uh, incident response teams. So I've kind of ran the gamut um, in terms of the cyber domain from both a, you know, independent contributor as well as um, in a leadership position. Um, in my time um, in, the, in the cybersecurity field, I have seen a lot. Uh, I've heard a lot. Uh, I'm sure, you know, we all have on this call um, things that just don't sit right with you, right? Whether or not it's someone who looks like you, um, it's someone who doesn't look like the majority. And I feel like as a person who's advocating for people to join this field because of, you know, quite frankly, how profitable it can be, um, it, it, it was very, it was becoming hard for me to swallow the pill of, hey, you know, we're, we're trying to get people into this field, but the field might not necessarily be ready for the people that were trying to get into the field, right? So what I wanted to do is affect change by, um, through my organization, really, you know, providing training and much needed ment mentorship, but also helping people have conversations, very honest conversations about financial literacy and generational wealth. Um, and as we continue, as we begin to move that needle, we can then try to maintain people of color and specifically black LGBTQ people um, in leadership positions. And now we can start to affect the change from the top down, right? So that's kind of the impetus for me starting hacking the workforce was, you know, you, you, you don't know that you can do it until you see it, right? And so being very visible and showing representation for um, black members of the LGBT community and just the black population period, um, you know, there's a lot of upside in this career. Um, and, you know, don't be frightened by people thinking, you, you know, you got to be able to code to do cybersecurity, right? So it's a little bit of my background. Thank you, Safi. And last but certainly not least, Tashaya. Hi, uh, the wise random. My name's Tasha Denos. I get that often. Hey, no, My it's apologies. <laughs> no, there's no apology there. There is a why, so it's okay. I get it often. So my name is Tasha Denos. I am a senior cybersecurity manager. I have been in this field for about 12 years now, um, doing everything from governance, risk, and compliance to um, vulnerability management in the private and the public sectors. But my favorite and most recent position within cybersecurity is becoming the brand and social media director for Black Girls in Cyber. Um, Black Girls in Cyber is a nonprofit focused with a mission of changing 
Black women's socio socioeconomic status. And how are we going to do that? We are going to train them and provide them with all of the tools that they need to enter privacy and security career fields. So that is pretty much my personal mission, focusing on how we do that. And um, my side job is working in a financial company to make sure that they are cybersecurity compliant. Excellent. Very impressive, all of, all of you. Uh, so again, thanks for taking time out of your day today. Uh, so let's, let's get into it, right? We're here to talk about the state of cybersecurity careers for Black professionals. So how would you describe that? Can you describe what you think, what, what's one word that you would use to describe the state of affairs today? And you can just feel free to jump in. I would say opportunity. Oh, we said the same thing. <laughs> Go ahead. Come on, man. That's exactly what it is. Opportunity. Okay. So I think I would take the uh, maybe half glass, glass half empty, but I would say dire. Mm. Dire. Very, very, very good. Uh, and I like opportunity as well. And um, I, I think, uh, I think that uh, as we talk, we'll, we'll share more about what the opportunities are, but let's talk about what are some of the barriers to, to entry, right? And what, it, what are some things that we can do to um, change them? So if any of you want to share from a personal experience or just at a high level, what do you believe are some of the barriers to working in this field? I would say the pipeline is broken. Um, I've worked with, I'm working right now um, on multiple fronts. We have plenty of educated, willing, ready, and focused workforce that can do the job, but the companies have the wrong outlook on what entry level looks like. So trying to explain to a company that five years of experience with a CISSP is not entry level is probably the biggest problem that we're running into right now. Yeah. I will agree with Tasha uh, that the pipeline is broken uh, and it needs not only government assistance, it needs nonprofits, it needs corporate everybody needs to be involved with shaping entry level up, having people access apprenticeships, entry level jobs, that needs to be visible to a person uh, on how to get into cyber security or security and privacy. I also will add that there is a human barrier that individuals have that they can't do the work because maybe you haven't seen somebody that looks like yourself speaking about their, their job, uh, or you might be hearing information from people who don't, who think that they know about tech technology or cybersecurity, but they don't actually know. So, so there is a human barrier that might uh, not allow you to move forward with your objective to get into cybersecurity. Um, and that's why a lot of the organizations that you have here, um, we're nonprofits and we are available. We, we have networks to help you um, to not only change your mindset, but to introduce you to people who have been, you know, who are currently in the field to introduce you to peers so you can laterally net, network across. Um, and I have actually seen people get jobs with no experience in security, get jobs just by networking within Black cybersecurity organizations. Yeah, those are great points. I think the networking piece is another part of the visibility and representation that gets challenging for some folks, right? You know, if you have to absolutely step outside of your comfort zone, right? If you're coming from 
you know, a majority, you know, you're, you, majority black institution, HBCU, you know, you're used to networking with certain types of people, you know, you had no one's asking you to, um, you know, uh, pretend or be fake in different environments, bring your whole self to a new environment and see what you can add to that environment, right? Not, not just, you know, coming to an, a networking event to take, right? Like what else, what can you do that instills in the person or the people who you're talking to that, you know, you're willing to go that extra mile, right? Because just to be frank, you know, we have to work twice as hard to get sometimes even half as far, right? So we do have to unfortunately do the work um, that other majority or other, other folks might not necessarily have to do, in, you know, in our off time, if you will, um, is uh, Tash, I don't want to mispronounce your name, Tash, Tasha right it's Tasha yeah all right so that Tasha mentioned or alluded to um you know she, she works her work primarily is with black girls in cyber oh oh and there's this other thing that she does to make sure right like that is the real work in my opinion is doing the work that no one is paying you to do right like so I, I think um, certainly networking um meeting as many people as you can you know being open to zoom coffees you know what it's it's a pandemic you know still despite what other people might <laughs> want to believe um you know we still are hopefully working from home and have some bandwidth and flexibility to just hop on a zoom call 20 minutes out of your day you know once or twice a week you'll see how far that will actually get you um as, and get your and will help get your name out there to people who are able to talk about you in a positive light when you're not in the room right like so those are the types of connections that you really want to be trying to make um as as you're trying to get your way in technically as well so no excellent advice safi and i shared recently um at another talk that this is like a great time, especially for the people that are introverted, because everything is virtual. You can just send emails. You can, you know, just, you know, send people LinkedIn requests and, you know, write a little note. Like now's the time. And you'll be surprised at how much more people are accessible now. Like I know that, you know, everyone, everyone's busy and things like that. But because we're in this remote world, you'll be surprised at how many people will be responsive. Uh, so I just wanted to just add that on uh, to what you shared, Safi. Um, so as we say, as we share, as we say here at RSI, diversity is security. And so why do you believe, or if you believe, so why is there a need for more uh, diverse representation in the field? And how has the lack of diverse representation impacted your, your work specifically? Anyone can jump in. I mean, you can look at it for, for the, why is diversity and security important? The quick answer is the adversary is diverse. You're looking at the, the people that are attacking the network and looking to make their impact look completely different. You are, they're not ever the same exact person. So if we're gonna be the ones protecting uh, our information and protecting the network and you know our, our company's most important assets, then we need diversity of thinking to, to add to that. Um, in all walks of life for any project that you're doing, you normally start to get information from multiple sources so you can execute that in the best way. That's the same thing that we should be looking at in, in uh, protecting our nation's assets. We should be looking at all the different ways to, that, to think about that from all different walks of life and then putting that into, um, putting that into to, to work. So I would say that the diversity of thinking is really the smartest way to protect diversity of security. I, that's that's such a that's a great point. The way you put it, because in my mind, I was I think we're saying the same thing. But the future of cybersecurity is intersectional. Like that's how I think of it. Right? You can't just say, okay, we have a black person. Right? Like let's look a little further at that person. Right? How do they identify? Where are they from? You know what what's their first language for example like what area of the world are they from right like so you can if you try to get to know someone you really understand how much more they can add to your security team right like i think hiring people who look the same traditionally will get you the same results 
And, uh, you know, I think we are at a deficit as a nation in terms of how we're able to protect our national assets, right? You know, we have, there are mercenaries that are, you know, playing around in our, uh, you know, sports, uh, uh, sports leagues and um, who was it, the 49ers got hacked the other day, right? So they're coming from for everybody, right? The colonial pipeline, um, the gas line, excuse me. Um, so I think really taking a look at how we're able to not only recruit intersectional identity folks, but also retain those people, right? Now, what I mean by that is making sure that benefits and pay are equitable across the board, right? Making sure that the, the old ways of doing business that might not fit with the current workforce, right? Like as, as, as people continue to retire and as you know, people are changing um, careers, people are looking for more than just you know, health insurance, right? They're looking for quality health insurance because these days, a lot of companies, that's a benefit. Not, not a lot of people these days expect to pay for health insurance. I know that sounds very privileged, but that is, that is the world that we're living in in the tech space where that is something that could ultimately make a candidate decide against you or one of your competitors, right? Like what, how, how far are you willing to go to retain the people who you worked hard to get into your company, right? So that's what I mean by, you know, intersectionality is just really, you have, you, you can't just look at the work person. You gotta look at the entire individual holistically if you want to be successful in retaining um, individuals, strong performers in cyber. And I agree with Tasha and Safi on diversity can help reduce or that the likelihood of a company or organization having a data breach. I'm going to also add that as in my role in data protection and data privacy, I specifically look at personally identifiable information of an individual. And it is my job to protect a user or consumer's personal information. It's also my job to protect the brand and reputation of an organization. And when you have people of diverse thoughts, um, gender, ethnicity, what I bring to the table when I'm coming into a meeting is my experience as a woman, as a person of color, my experience as a career changer, that I did have another career prior where I worked with, with large groups of people and I've traveled the country and I've lived in other countries. So by, by someone hiring somebody with my type of profile, you have more than one person. I'm multidimensional when I think about how should this product, how should this process or system protect our country, protect the organization. And I will stop a conversation or stop a meeting and I will input what it could mean to a woman if you try to track them and that product tracks them to a location where somebody who they may not want to know where they're located. Or um, if they're pub, if they're, home address or if is publicly known, how, how might that impact them? Or even what they like to do on the weekends, hobbies or things like that. Some people are just private people and they want the chance to opt out of maybe that marketing or opt out of having their data analyzed in some way that they did not expect it to. So, so that's what diversity means to me and how when when I work, that's how I speak and talk in meetings is, is to express myself and be authentic. Yes, to authenticity. <laughs> okay. Um, so we so you guys said a mouthful, right? And again, we're we're focused on uh, the state of, of careers and how we're impacted. So Getting black people in the door is one thing, right? But getting black people to stay is another. 
So let's talk a little bit about retention and how we can fix some of those issues. Like we touched on barriers to entry. So now we're in and, you know, people are just dealing with different types of environments, you know, toxic work cultures or uh, benefits as Safi touched on. So what are some things that we can do to fix retention issues in the field? I'll, I'll jump in. I, I believe that not all workplaces have to be toxic for people of, of color or women or people with d different um, um, views and opinions. I believe that there's enough jobs out here that you can find your tribe. And what I mean by that you can find an organization that appreciates your, your values and what you think. And if you are currently in a toxic work environment or you're not happy, it doesn't even have to be toxic. You yourself know that something is wrong and you are not happy where you are. Have a plan to get out. Some of us cannot just leave jobs because we, we, we don't have that bank account that has a safety net. So I understand that. But I had an exit plan for a, a job in technology that I was not happy with. Um, and I was interviewing for over six months. And I can tell you from my personal experience, I had a lot of job interviews. I had a lot of opportunity uh, to work with different companies. And my tribe, the company that I ultimately will be starting work with this month, we found each other. It was, it, and, and when I say that your, your, your tribe will find you, you also need to go outside your comfort zone to, look at different areas where you can find that job because it may not be through just applying. And so the retention really sets upon the individual um, to, to speak when they either start or begin a job about your expectations and what you would like to learn and having that conversation during the interview process because we all have that intuition to know, is this right for me? Is it not right for me? Yep. Um, correct, yes. And I'll stop there. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, Safi or, or Tasha, any, any input on how to fix the retention issues? Yeah, uh, so I think, I think a lot of, I definitely agree with a lot of what Sanju just mentioned. Um, I'm kind of torn between the subject of ERGs, right? So I think ERGs can sometimes be more performative, if that makes sense for an organization, right? Like I think- Afi, can you explain what um, ERGs are, please? Sorry, um, employee resource group. So um, organizations will have uh, employee resource groups that are specific to, they can have um, some for like uh, black employees, um, LGBTQ employees, um, you know, then they can do it by like geolocation. So people who live in a certain area. Um, but I think sometimes um, ERG, the work of an ERG is to sometimes be the safety net or be there for the employee. And so, I think that sometimes that takes a lot of the onus off of the organization themselves and puts a lot of the onus on other employees who are going through, you know, some of the same things that are could be affecting the entire um, subcategory of an uh, of an organization's employees. Um, for example, you know, uh, Black Black Lives Movement. <clears throat> all of the past few years, right? You know, as things really hit the pinnacle, um, you know, mid uh, 2021, um, you started to see, or excuse me, mid 2020, you started to see 
employee resource groups where people were trying to be shoulders for each other in a very difficult situation. Um, one, this is on top of their day jobs, right? So this is also, you know, they're going through these very real emotions about the state of, you know, their safety and their children's safety and their family members' safety, but also having to do the work that someone who is trained in this and who gets paid to do this should be there doing, right? Like I know a few organizations actually invited, you know, DNI specialists and people to help with um, some of those conversations, but I think employee resource groups can be beneficial if they're a mechanism to help get employee support, not when it's turned into employees being the ones who are beholden to give the support for other members of the organization. So, um, but I do think, like, as I mentioned, an, an ERG can be a good way to, to accomplish um, mechanisms for increased retention at organizations. They just have to be done the right way. I don't think, it, oh, I was to keep it short as possible. I don't think it's employees responsibility. I think companies need to understand that there's bias. They are biased. They look, they look like themselves. They're looking at themselves in the room. They have to, to get the awareness that Tom is looking at Jim and we're the same person. So maybe there does need to be a Tasha in the, with a Y in the room. Maybe there does need to be a Safi or a Sanju in the room. That's that's what needs to change. Um, all of the, you know, the, the job recs need to be looked at as, as bias, just like an SAT, SAT questions have bias, job recs have bias. We need to have an overhaul and there probably at some point needs to be some type of coordination between our, um, our types of groups and these different companies. And um, at, at some point, the most beautiful thing would be us joining all together and being like, have you noticed that there's a problem here? And we are here to fix it. But as you're recognizing that there's a problem, this is how you fix it. And then we'll shoo all of our people in. And then Tom will, will be looking at Tasha instead of Jim. That's the easiest way I could put it. But I don't think it's our responsibility. No. Nope. Excellent, excellent responses. So I think uh, that's that's a good segue into talking about uh, policy. So now let's touch on what you're seeing in terms of policies within companies and organizations related to diversity, and what would you like to see implement implemented or, or changed. I think I've said the same two things over. It's the pipeline needs to be fixed. There, there has to be, I'm seeing a lot more cohorts and, and different, um, different opportunities where people are getting government funding to build, um, build up the workforce. But I think right now, the most important thing where there needs to be intersection with policy and um, the, the companies is, fixing how that pipeline works and figuring out like what does an entry level applicant look and kind of baseline that across in the same way that the NICE framework does it, baseline that and provide that to companies and make it some type of requirement so we can start getting some butts in these empty seats. Yeah, I mean, I think that is, that that's the perfect answer, right? I think sometimes we have to remember that particularly if even for the government organizations, um, but certainly for private industry, you know, we need to tie diversity numbers to salaries. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, we're having um, in the federal government poems, or I'm not sure if you all are familiar with those plans of actions and milestones um, in the federal government, if a CIO doesn't close their poems in time or has overdue poems or like a poem is the reason for a vulnerability, like that is a direct correlate, that is directly correlated to their performance review, right? So if we start having conversations about with people in leadership about, hey, if you don't instill in your recruiters, your managers, your other leaders that we are really putting our money where our mouth is, I don't really think anything is gonna change quite frankly. Right, so if we if we talk about decreasing government funding to organizations uh, that just have 
trash diversity numbers. You know, <laughs> money makes moves. <laughs> so, you know, I think definitely taking it to that level where it really has to be from the top down, right? Like the policy changes, hey, we have to have, and it's not, these are not diversity hires. These are mechanisms to make sure that equal opportunities are given to talented cyber professionals, period. Like at the end of the day, it's, we're, we're really talking about equality in these roles and equity in life, right? So financial freedom, financial stability, building generational wealth, you know, be, having the means and the mechanisms to take care of your health, mind, body, spirit. All of those things come with being able to be at a place where you do not feel targeted, you do not feel like you're the only, you know, having the wherewithal to not feel like you have to work 12, 14 hours a day in order to keep to keep your job while other people are definitely not working as hard as you, right? So I really feel like leadership, it, this is, you know, we're, we're already headed that way in terms of, you know, if uh, cybersecurity, uh, if, if a breach happens, the CEO can no longer be like, oh, I didn't know, right? Like, so you can no longer plead ignorance to the lack of diversity and the, the lack of preparedness that your organization quite frankly has because of the lack of diversity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm just in 100% alignment with what Safi and Tasha just said. Okay, so let's talk about money. Right. So it's, it's, yes. So it's no secret that uh, cybersecurity is, is, is one of like the top uh, paying fields. And I shared the stat about the medium uh, salary being over, over six figures. Um, so, what are some top roles uh, that you can you just give us like some insight into like some, some, roles that people should look into um, and any information that you have on salaries, just share. Just I just want to make sure that we touch on that a little bit, just very briefly. Sure. Yeah, I can go really quickly. So um, from a salary perspective, so I, I would look at it, I would look at salary two different ways um, if I was getting into the field or already in the field. One is path of least resistance, right? So look up what are some of the most available jobs, right? There are a ton of GRC, uh, governance risk and compliance positions, right? Auditor, auditor roles, assessment roles, like those are roles that I think have the least barrier to entry and a pre pretty significant yield in terms of salary, right? If, and I think it's also one of the best ways to get into cybersecurity by learning like the policies, the rules, um, you know, why you're doing, wh what the benchmarks are for, like why you're doing we're telling the engineers to do these things or why are you assessing a system in a specific way and learning the baseline and like the fundamentals NIST 853 you know FedRAMP um, any of those um, you know just policies from a best industry best practice perspective if you can learn those and get into one of those GRC roles I think I, the sky is up from there, right? Because at that point, you can potentially move laterally to an engineering position because you understood why those were why those um, policies were being put in place. Um, you could pivot to a you know secure application developer role. You could pivot into incident response. I mean, GRC for me, honestly, is the path I usually tell people to take. Thank you for that. Anyone else want to add really quickly before we uh, move to wrapping up soon? Yeah, I can make a little quick addition to that. So I would say for starting out, if you're just getting, you don't have any experience, I would be honest with yourself. It's okay to get, you can jump quickly. So it's okay to start with like let, being realistic. You're not going to come in the door with six figures. Let's, let's look at it. You come in the door, 60, 70, 80,000, depending on where you are in the world. And then you have an opportunity to figure out where you want to go. Uh, a lot of people, one of the main questions I always get, well, where do I start? What I, soft skills are key. Communication is, 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 is key. 
being able to write and and that goes to what Safi was saying to be able to write and speak well and having different relationship being able to build relationships with people that are actually very technical doing hands on keyboard that's where you're your best to start when you start getting into analyst roles um, when you're when you're getting into engineering roles that's when you're looking at the the 120 to 150 to to be honest this career field, people are making 300, I know people making 200 and $300,000 a year, but you want to get that groundwork. You want to know what you want to do first and get certs in that, study in that. This is not a job field that you can just come in and sit. Everything is ever changing consistently. So you wanna always be somebody that's researching and knowing exactly what the next um, the next new software is. What's the next new cert that's coming out and engulf yourself in, in blogs, engulf yourself in um, now, um, conferences are virtual. Give your chance to give yourself to a, a virtual conference and meet recruiters there and get more information. I'll just yeah. plug the data privacy field really quickly. Sure. Data privacy is high. Uh, lots of job opportunities. Um, I, if you're on the legal side, you will have to have a law degree, but I am not I am on the operational side, so I operationalize companies' data privacy programs. Uh, the, there's so many jobs now about data privacy and data protection um, with uh, entry level, something that will be close to six figures, not six figures, but once you're in, you can easily make six figures for a data privacy role for a couple of years of experience. So, and contact me on LinkedIn if you need information. And uh, just to, I really wanna make sure we touch on this too. Like, do you think there's enough emphasis on uh, traditional learning versus certifications? And do you have a preference for, uh, for either of those, those uh, methods? If you could just quickly share. I think honestly, it's case by case. I like I, I don't I would never say carte blanche go this way, carte blanche go that way. I am a lifelong learner. I hopefully will be graduating with my doctorate in cybersecurity in May. Um, so that's how I've always stayed current, right? Like I'm I love researching things. I happen to love writing also. So for me, the school route was the best way for me to like just continue to like see where I want it to be. I just need that type of structure. But I absolutely know engineers that just have minds that are just like steel traps and they can go on YouTube, they can watch a Udemy or a Linux Academy video and pick up something like that and go get a cert. So I really think it depends on you, how you best learn and how you best absorb information. I started in the field with, um, I got my security plus, uh, and be because I was looking at different information security jobs that I thought I could be good at, um, I got my hands dirty uh, with technical bits, learning about GRC and compliance. Uh, I believe if you're a career changer, I honestly believe that you should study uh, security plus uh, and just get that baseline knowledge of how data protection and securing six systems work. I will, um, nowadays, sometimes you may not need a certification, but you need the knowledge. Even if you don't take the certification, nobody can take away that knowledge from you. And I believe experience um, and passion, people can see through that. People can't see your certification. I've always been hired first for my passion and for my diligent uh, learning capabilities to the profession. But I believe that studying for a cert is always good because you, even if you don't take that exam, nobody can take that knowledge away from you. And you can apply it to your job search and when you're on the job because you have the book. Thank you, Sanju. And I think, oh, excuse me. <laughs> I think uh, with that, we will wrap up for today. And again, I just can't 
thank you enough, um, Sanju, Safi, Tasha, uh, for taking time out of, of your day. I did plug in the chat their organizations. It's, it's somewhere you, you guys have been busy in this chat. Uh, so it's it's somewhere in there, or you know, I'll, we'll send out all the information after the uh, the message. Uh, Tasha, are you, did you have were you raising? Okay, yeah. So get busy in the chat. Uh, we'll also send out uh, information. But again, I want to thank you, Sanju, Safi, Tasha, for today for your knowledge. I learned a lot as I shared. I started my journey, so I'll, I'll be in touch. Uh, Thank you to um, everyone that made today possible. Um, thank you for all the attendees for all of your, your, um, your questions. And I see you, you all swapping uh, LinkedIn, <laughs> LinkedIn uh, links, which I, which I love to see. So make sure that you stay connected. Um, and again, this was brought to you by the R Street Institute's Cybersecurity and Emerging Threats team um, as part of the Making Space Initiative, uh, where we're looking to increase diversity and ensure that more women and uh, people of color are represented on panels and at events. Um, and I just want to quickly touch on Cyberbase, which is our online resource, uh, online resource featuring Black cybersecurity professionals. I plugged it in the chat, but please, if you know anyone that is a professional that's working in the space, uh, nominate them. Uh, this conversation that we had is the first of many, and we're looking forward to um, engaging more of you and making more impact and changing policies. So thank you again, everyone, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Take care. Bye.